You know, there are some people that just ooze positivity and your two speakers this morning are c certainly fit that bill, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Brian and Sheila, um, light up a room and you're incredibly positive gentlemen, Brian. I've got your introduction here, some of which you gave me. This is what Brian asked me to say. Brian Dolan is uh, a dual qualified mental health nurse who was born when he was very young and isn't dead yet. It's what we like in our speakers. <laughs> we like them a little less dead. He trained in the west of Ireland and then fancied some travel, so he moved to jolly old England. His career has included clinical practice in emergency care research, in academic general practice, editorship of a major emergency nursing uh, journal. He's also written five books, uh, executive leadership roles in the NHS, and currently works with one of the world's most integrated healthcare systems, Canterbury Health System in New Zealand as Director of Service Improvement. Uh, Bri Bri, as I like to call him, has also worked as a nursing advisor for the BBC drama Holby City and was once asked why someone with a ruptured aorta would have a sense of impending doom. <laughs> What's that all about? <laughs> Brian holds masters from King's College London and Oxford Uni and is currently doing his PhD. He told me he's in sinus tachycardia. Does, any, does anyone know what that means? Yeah, yeah right. So pre-presentation, fast heart beating. Um, so he's pooing his pants, basically. Um, would you... <laughs> good cleanse. It's good to cleanse. It's good to cleanse. Um, would you please welcome uh, Director of Qualitas Consortium, Mr. Brian Dolan. Now I'm going into SVT. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, so much for the, uh, the invitation. And I got this um, email from Murphy. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Innocent until proven Irish. <laughs> have, have you turned him on? <laughs> <laughs> If you don't want to see the results, look away now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what time is it? It's, uh, it's nine o'clock, so we're only half an hour late uh, to the start. So over the course of the next four or five hours, what I'll be talking to you about <laughs> is uh, leadership, influence and culture. And I got this uh, email out of the blue from Murphy uh, to come and I thought, when, you know, if you're Irish, anyone called Murphy, the answer is yes already. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Murphy, you know, she's one of these quiet stars, you know, like worth her weight in petrol and has been just fantastic. So thank you to, to Murphy and all of the team for the invitation. I'm, I'm truly grateful. <laughs> oh, that cat's got to go. So... That, by the way, is, uh, is my Twitter handle, and I do, um, I often say to people, Twitter is, honest to God, it's not just about the Kardashians. It is the greatest source of continuing professional development I have ever come across. You know, I've downloaded whole chapters and books even on uh, some of my passions around uh, PhD work, patient safety, lean thinking, quality improvement. It is a sensational resource, so, honest to God, go to it because it is a really, really good resource, honestly. But what I'm going to talk to you about, as I say, is around leadership, culture, influence, and to my mind, <coughs> oh my gosh, look at that, I nearly hit puberty. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, as I see it, uh, leadership is a social process where one person influences the behaviour of others without threat or violence, although I know it's tempting at times. But what's really important to remember is how you do it, that's what counts. And what I'd like you to do, what we're going to do is walk through an autobiography in five chapters, an autobiography of life by a Buddhist monk, monk and his name was Nayushal Kempo. And what he said was this, I walk down the street, there's a deep hole in the sidewalk, I fall in, I am lost, I'm hopeless. It isn't my fault, it takes forever to climb out. Chapter two, 
I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole on the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe it. I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. What do you think the first line of chapter three is going to be? <laughs> there is a deep hole on the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. First line of chapter four. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. And chapter five, I walk down another street. <laughs> now, what is this really about? Well, what it's about is these things, about ignorance and denial, comfort, knowledge, and ultimately enlightenment. And the first time something ever happens to you is um, it's brand new. You've got no background, no experience. It might, it might be the first time you, you know, sat in the chair as a practice nurse and thinking, oh, my God. Has any of you had this experience, by the way, when you start a job? Three or four weeks in, you kind of think, any minute now, somebody from HR, that's the, that's the human remains department. <laughs> They're going to come in and say, look, we're re <laughs> if somebody's from HR, I've got a crosshairs on my forehead. <laughs> They're going to say, look, we're really sorry. We didn't mean you to get the job at all. It's been a complete mistake. <laughs> Anyone ever had that? It's, it, it's called imposter syndrome. I wake up every morning, like this morning. <laughs> I'm sure you do as well. You you know, it's, 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 it's common to us all, but we, you know, we kind of don't know what to expect. And because we don't know what to expect, you know, and, and it's ignorance in the kindest, truest sense of the world, we don't know how to fix it. Which is very different from denial, which is where a lot of people live, because it's not new. And one should have some insight, but elect not to do so. And then get very surprised when the same behavior creates the same results. Have you ever noticed, like, there's some parents that are screaming at their children, and they wonder why the children are always screaming? And one of the things I think is you'll hear them say, I'm going to kill you. Now, children work out fairly quickly. <laughs> that's not likely to happen, really, you know. But they're kind of wondering how it can be happening. But that's different then from comfort, which is where somebody has the knowledge and they know the outcome, they can fix it. But you know what? Don't some people love being victims? Because it feels safe not to have to do anything. And it feels harder for them, they think, than anyone else. You know, you were shipwrecked. I was drowned. <laughs> you know? But that's different to when you get to knowledge. It's where you see the problem, you find a solution, you do the same things in a different way. One of the things I was a, it's really still very rare for a nurse to become a clinical director, but I was a clinical director of a couple of emergency departments. And we got rid of triage. Now, for some people in ED, that'd be like slapping Bambi in front of its mother. Never <laughs> should be done. But we did different things, and we reduced our waiting time dramatically, because instead of triage being a safety net, it was a bottleneck. What we did is we used our knowledge and our experience to change behavior. And when you start off in life, you know, you gain in our nursing careers, you know, we're, we're learning constantly. You know, you start in a new role, you're, you're gaining knowledge. And with that knowledge, it becomes deeper and broadens and it gets more experience as you join the dots. But you know what it is that experts do? They go beyond that. They get creative. And it's also about thinking of the world through the prism of another's lens. It's not about how we think it should work. It's how does it work in the real world? Because that's your design, but there's your experience. But there are also those who insist that you can't do anything. We can't do anything unless we have more evidence. So what do we want? Evidence change. When do we want it? After a peer review, please. <laughs> because that's an opportunity to kind of you know, and, and aren't governments great at that? You know, and sometimes when you see people who want to make, create change, oh, where, have you seen, where's the articles, where's the research to back it up? Well, sometimes when you're in the creative space, you're making change happen because it's experiential development, it's growth, and never waste a crisis. If you have a challenge, take the opportunity, go for it, and make it safe. But what happens too often out the front line? We get all of these dictums. You get the ministry, the departments of health, saying this is what we want, and you have your CEOs and your executive leaders with their 10 priorities. Then the directors with 15, and management, by the time you get to the front line, it's like, so what is it this week? Is it diabetes or is it smoking cessation? You know, is it weight loss or weight gain? You know, and, and it's like, which are the problems? And, and, and measures drive behavior. And if you create all these kind of measures, actually people get very distracted, because there they are trying to focus but actually, we're saying focus on our marketing priorities, and we won't get distracted by the show. Oh, look, squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and I was talking to a very good man today, Richard, Professor Richard, and we were talking about uh, 
a mental health thing. And, you know, it's really striking that when new governments come in, whatever the last government did, no matter how good it was, was they dissociate from it. We saw that anyone... How many here from New South Wales? So you... Oh, my God, look, it's a small forest that went up there. And, you know, you'll be very familiar, and fact, many will, will be, with the Garling Report. And Deb Toms, the, the former Chief Nursing Officer of New South Wales, now the, the uh, Chief Exec of uh, ACN, you know, she was the lead for that and was doing some really good work. And, it, you know, it was challenging behaviours and assumptions and really driving centres of care come out of it. New government comes in, it gets dropped like a hot brick. And that, to me, just is morally wrong, because what you're doing is ideology-based practice and ideology-based policy-making rather than evidence-based. Although, I have to tell you, I was quite impressed with Susan Lay yesterday. I don't know about the rest of you. And it's very much about style, isn't it? Now, I don't know, I can't remember the name of her predecessor, but by all accounts, he could cause a fight in an empty room. <laughs> Whereas it appears her style is that much more inclusive. She's going around talking, and, you know, fair play to her, the woman, the, the week that it was. But it's also a measure of what the Kiwis would call your mana as an organisation, your authority, that she came during Budget Week. So, tribute to you all for enabling that. But the trouble is, when we're kind of constantly distracted by all sorts of stuff, it's an opportunity to not always address the elephant that's in the room. <laughs> As uh, Director Qualitas, um, we have got the licenses from the National Health, the NHS England, to be enabled to train, support people around productive general practice, productive leader, productive community services, productive ward, productive operating theatre. And when we were developing what is a major nursing leadership program for New South Wales, we've got about 400 nuns and mums going through it at the moment. It's been so successful that their managers are saying, can we have one? So I'm writing the curriculum around that. And what we were doing when we were commissioned initially to do this leadership development program, and the lead, you know, leadership includes like how to get rid of uh, a day a week of waste. What would you do if you had an extra day a week to do things? And one of the bits was we looked at what was it that the, the, the staff wanted. And one of our, our great uh, team, Dr. Gail Pileski, an, an ICU midwife, all sorts, and she came up with this model which actually kind of drives what it is we do, and it's about this. What is an excellent nursing or midwifery leader? Well, it's about their head. Well, they're focused on good quality patient experience and care, committed to learning and developing the team, using one's brains, having a commu confident communicator, understanding people themselves with self-awareness and others, having a positive heart about inspiring and challenging, about engaging people, going out and reaching out, about having that being technically skilled of the, or using your hands, your tools to be able to be assisted by experts within the wider team. We do not work in isolation. We work as a part of a bigger thing. And it seems to me that what this is about as nursing leaders, all of us, because leadership is not a title, it's a set of behaviours. And to me it's about having knowledge in your head, having, having passion in your heart, having skills in your hand, and most of all having a fire in your soul to make the world be a better place. But that said, you know, we've all been in this situation, haven't we? <laughs> How in God's name did I get here? Just don't ask. I'm not sure. But yes, please, I could do it a bit of help. But to my mind, <laughs> that dog posed for hours. He was very good to me. He was very, very... <laughs> he started as a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> to my mind, leadership is about these elements. It's about knowing yourself and your impact you have on others. And I worked with somebody once, and her name was Maria. And every now and again, Maria would go off like a big bottle of cola. And she'd go, oh, it's because I'm Italian, we're like this. I said, hang on, Mar Maria, your parents are Italian, you were bred, born and raised in England. You don't have to speak in an Italian accent. <laughs> you know? But the thing is, Maria had so little self-awareness, we would be left picking up the pieces, and she thought it was everybody else. And everyone worked like that? Anyone seen that? Um, influence. It's about persuasive ideas and the process. How are we doing for time? Yeah, we still have till tomorrow. <laughs> have you all got a biro or a pen handy? Could you find one? Right. We're going to do this for about, about a minute or less. It's a very important job you have ahead of you now. Are you ready? If you haven't got one, pretend, just fake it. What I would like you to do right now is this. I would like you to sell a biro, your pen, to your neighbour. Your life depends on it. Away you go, you have a minute. Away you go, start selling your pen to your neighbour.
Okay, lovely people. Right. Okay. I tell you what. There was some ferocious horse trading going on in this room. <laughs> so, uh, anyone got microphones or something like that? What was, your, what was your sales pitch? Who was, what were you selling? How were you going? What was your sales pitch? Mark, were you talking to yourself? You're on your own there. <laughs> did, did you win? You were using colour. That was your approach. Very good. Who else? Speak up so we can all hear. You, you use sex appeal. And it worked. Wow. So, you had a what? They bought it for $1 million. They wanted it for a million dollars. That's what. Ask why. I said if you use it and you put it by your pillow and you have sex, you feel God. <laughs> <laughs> for those who are wondering at the back, if you have sex with this pen, you will see God. <laughs> Is it too early in the morning to ask? <laughs> Is that why you hear sometimes you say, oh Lord, I'm coming. Is that what it's about? <laughs> no, I back in England. <laughs> <laughs> like back in Thank God I'm Irish then. <laughs> I should say, us oh, Irish, you know, there we are. We go, to, we go out and sow our wild oats all week and then we go to Mass on Sunday and pray for crop failure. So, <laughs> where's the one back in the back? Yes, please do. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> I'm not playing poker with you. I'll be. <laughs> Was there another one over there? Um, I said my friends pen that have craft. Yeah, crafty. But let me ask you all this: How many of you, when you were selling your pen, asked the other person what it is they wanted to buy? Because <laughs> the thing is, this we don't like to be sold, but we do like to buy. Have any of you had this great idea? And you've got this really great idea in your practice and you're really desperately trying to sell it. And you can't persuade people because you are trying to sell. But actually the trick in persuasion, this exercise is about influencing skills. And the trick in persuasion is find what it is the other person wants. If you said to me, can I borrow your million dollar, uh, your million dollar pen there, Sheila? <laughs> you know you'll never see it again. I'm single. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> not for much longer. <laughs> the thing is, if you said to me, would you like a pen? I said, look, I've got so many of them. They all work perfectly until I want to write down a number, of course. But if you said to me, could you make use of this? I said, well, do you know what? That's kind of a handy little ruler. Or if it gets too cool or warm in here, I could use it as a door jam. Or, a, a, you know, I, it'd be good for a bookmark. That's what I want to buy. And the thing is this, when we think we're trying to persuade people, we think give them more evidence, give them more logic, give them more facts, that'll persuade them. But we don't make decisions logically. We apply them emotionally and then we put in post hoc rationalization to justify the decision we make. We feel this, this and then we logically jump, jump to the conclusion that that's the right thing. Has anyone ever been in a situation where you, you see this absolutely just you take it home, it's absolutely gorgeous till you get it home and then you think, well, the dress will be really lovely if I lose five kilos. <laughs> but what language do we use when we see something we want? We talk the language of love. I love it. We use the language of emotion and then we apply the logic to justify the emotional response. So when you're talking to somebody, talk and then you're looking to persuade them, talk to their heart and their mind will follow. If you talk only to their heads, you may not get... And, and actually, counterintuitively, and climate change is a good example of this, trying to persuade people about changing climate, you know, climate change, actually what people do is they dig their heels in harder. So the more evidence you give, the more they become entrenched because it's about the, the threat response to us. So persuading people, managing up... A lot of people say to me, managing staff is easy, it's managing the boss. Jeez, that's a whole different story altogether. <laughs> And about your organizational culture, what is it that makes it tick? You know, how does it really work? Is how this is how, because the thing is, culture is what happens under the surface. You know, you've got the, your, your, your structure, if you like, 
is your, your, um, your anatomy, you know, your policies, your, your jobs, all that sort of stuff. Your physiology is the processes, and culture will always eat strategy for lunch. It's always how things really work around here. But it's also about reflecting that we have choices. We have a choice of attitude. Sheila, good luck. <laughs> I gather you're going to be talking about sex later as well. We have a you have a choice of behaviour, how you respond. Look at the police officers. They are amazing men and women, aren't they? Under you know, enormous bad behaviours, they don't react. Because we have a choice of our response. How we respond is a choice. If you get angry at me, it doesn't obligate me to get angry. It's my choice. Just as our passion, that too is a choice. If you think about kids, have you ever noticed with kids, one minute they're killing themselves, the next minute they're giggling and laughing. Do you notice that? How much more they're laughing all the time. And I learned this very early on. If you can laugh at yourself, you won't have a smile off your face for very long. You know, and it's about our choices. <laughs> And it's kind of, um, you know, if you can just find enjoyment and joy in things. I'm trying to decide, how are we doing? No, we won't. Ah, hell, we will. Right. What I'd like you to do is this. Answer this question. We'll give it about 30, 40 seconds. We'll be really quick. Jump to the thing. When did you last do something just for the fun, just for the crack? The Irish variety, not the drugs. <laughs> what is it that makes you laugh? And can I ask you, as you're having this very quick one-minute conversation, that you talk about things that are normally considered legal. So, <laughs> talk about yourself, what makes you laugh, what, and not just work stuff, anything you like, chat among yourselves. What is it that makes you laugh? When did you last have something just for the fun? Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's always impossible once this thing gets going. <laughs> so, anybody like to share the legal things? Anyone like to share what makes you laugh when you laugh at something just for the fun? How about somebody in this group here? No, please don't pick at me. Please don't. Yes, thank you. Lovely Deb. Speak up so we can. <laughs> and now tell me, is that wine with a H or without? <laughs> see, wine, you see, if you think about it, it's processed fruit. It should be one of your five a day, you know, so truly. <laughs> Very good, Deb. Anybody else? What about on this side over here? Oh, no, please don't pick at me. I know you're looking at me. Says the woman in the glasses. No, don't do this to me. <laughs> Actually, it's a good bride. What, you don't have fun over this? Oh, I'm very... <laughs> Thank you. Help them out here, Bill. <laughs> we are really excited on Friday night having family movie night. The kids are watching really old movies like Ghostbusters. Oh, cool. Ghostbusters. Ah, oh, that's cute. Nice, like that. And a lot of people will say, you know, it's family time, it's personal time. You know, that, that's great. And the thing is, it's choices. Those passions are choices. Have you ever had that moment where you're wandering, you know, you, you meet someone and you see someone and you think, oh, I know them. And then, so there it was, I fly a lot, and I was in the Emirates Lounge in Dubai. And uh, I thought, oh, hello, and that's when I realised I don't know the former Prime Minister of New Zealand at all. <laughs> <laughs> and there I was, thinking, oh, jeez. And now she waved back, me and Helen Clark could have been VBS in no time. <laughs> but I was, I was on my way to rush into the plane, and I got to the plane, and it wasn't very far away, you know. Uh, the, the, the boarding gate, and I'm still chuckling to myself, taking out the ticket, and, and I'm laughing away, and uh, it's oh, hello, Mr. Dolan, how are you? And, you know, says the boarding gate person, and he said, oh, you, you know, you won't believe what I did, and I tell him, 
He says, oh, it's one of you, you're one of our frequent flyers. My goodness, that was embarrassing. I said, oh, I don't know where to look. He says, look, tell you, stay there for a minute. Said, oh, my God, he's going to bring me a, you know. And next thing, two minutes later, he's back. He says, look, Mr. Dones, uh, you're one of our very frequent flyers. It's a, it's a very full flight, and it's the A380, you know, the double-decker. So today, if you don't mind, we're going to put you into first class. <laughs> they have, the Emirates ones, they have showers. Showers in first class. So it's like 20 past eight this morning, in the morning, they're saying to me, so, would you like some Dom Perignon champagne? And I says, Jesus, it's five o'clock somewhere, I will indeed. <laughs> it's a choice. You could be all grumpy or you could just take those choices. And Carlos Castaner, he had this to say, we either make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong and the amount of work is the same. Because look at it as what we sometimes do to ourselves, our beliefs, our values, our worries about being criticised and blamed. Supposing when you go back on Monday and uh, the senior manager, the CEO, the most senior person in the organisation you work in says, uh, you get a note that says, I need to see you urgently. Would you think, <laughs> at last the recognition I have craved <laughs> all these years? Would you think, oh, shh. <laughs> it's the second, isn't it? Of course it is, because these are our habits. The reason we get a middle name when we're children is because it's a measure of how much trouble we're in. <laughs> you know? Does anyone recognize this sort of simple sabotage? Perfectionism. Oh, no, we can't submit that uh, thing until it's absolutely right. Procrastination. We have to have this thing in by July. They never said which one. And martyrdom. Now, us nurses, aren't we sensational martyrs? We are fantastic. <laughs> Jesus, Joan, would you get off the bonfire? We need the wood, you know? <laughs> and self-pity. We are just gloriously self. And it is. It's not a new DRG. It's a, it's a thing I call MOPE syndrome, which stands for the most oppressed people ever. <laughs> no one, no one knows our suffering. And how do you change habits? Well, first of all, you have to ask yourself, what do you get out of it? What is it? You know, smoking. People, there is a reason why people do, because they get something from it. What's the benefit of changing it? As my dad used to say, God rest him, it's like having words with yourself. And also unconditioning and practicing. You know, if you write something down in pencil, it means you're not as committed than if you write it down in pen. Why? You rub it out. It's about practice. It's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. Or to put it more succinctly, fake it till you make it. <laughs> and eventually, and in time, you will bake free. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> so, look at though. Is it, you know, there's some people, they love being the victims. Ah, oh, it's always me, you know, it's, uh, the boss doesn't like me, the weather, the food, the clothes, the friends, nothing is easy. And isn't that true? There's some people who just love that. But, you can see here, it's a big but. Check you are not stuck. Check you are not stuck. Ask people who, who will tell you the things that you don't want to hear, but they love you enough and they care enough about you to want you to be an even better person. And they are your best friends. They're your best lover. They're your best sibling. They're your best friends, your partners, all of the people who care enough about you to say, that wasn't okay. And they're the ones we need to hold on to in our lives because there's plenty of people who blow smoke. Oh, that was grand. No, it wasn't. I know it wasn't, you know. But that doesn't mean that, you know, this fantastic organization, APNA, what it's not trying to do is create a leadership like everybody. It's not trying to make everyone the same, you know. It's not like that at all. <laughs> Irish baby. Like his father, no hair, no teeth. <laughs> the thing is, does anyone recognize this? The busyaholic, you know? Somebody says to you, what's your desk made of? I don't know, I can't, I can't tell underneath it. No time for pampering, you're constantly, you know, firefighting, you don't know the last book you read, you constantly lose your keys, you don't have time to call people back, you've got a memory like a sieve. Somebody says to you on Tuesday, how would you get it? I don't know, it's gone. That's... You're, you're, you rarely taste what you eat, you're like a human Dyson, you hoover it, you know? You can't relax, you miss the buzz when you're not performing. Your idea of fun these days is a cardiac arrest during handover. You know? 
you got no patience with people. You want the answers now. You're always late. You push off to the last second. You feel under constant pressure. You wake up with central crushing chest pain. You realise the dog's on your chest again. <laughs> you shout at other drivers. You're not even in a car at the time. You shout at other drivers. <laughs> the thing is, to, when it comes to influence, it's about making the most of yourself, the impact you want to make, knowing your own personal power. The thing is, you know, we'd all love to be, I don't know, taller, thinner, prettier, this or that. Or, isn't it true? You know, we all want that. And it's about our choice of attitude. Like, to, I, I've, for example, I've got the body of a god. Sadly, it's Buddha, but it's work in progress. You know? It's about our choices. It's about knowing the impact we want to make. Our, you know, do you remember when, I, I bet it's not a woman or a man in this room who doesn't have, you know, our nursing colleagues and those who are not, Somebody who influenced them when we were baby nurses, when we were, they, were the, they were the person we wanted to be when, they, when we grew up. Wasn't that right? Mine was a guy called John Joe Kenny, staff nurse. He was very exotic because he'd been to England. Yes. <laughs> and years later, and he shaped my thinking about my profession. And years later, many years later, he was looking after my then dying father, 11 years this year, and I had the chance to say thank you for what he did. So find that person and say thank you before it is too late. Because I promise you, I bet you many of them won't know. They won't know. And likewise, you won't know the impact you have on others. But it's about valuing yourself and your own skills. Because if you don't value yourself, why would anyone bother? And not being intimidated by another's power. The most senior person, the boss, says, I want to see you. And you say, oh, I want to see you too, sunshine. And buy you, you're buying the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Practice. Because credibility is what we know, how we look, how we behave, but most of our credibility lies within ourselves, how we feel. And what is it that is the personality of healthcare? Well, one of the best books I've read in the last decade, I've read a number of good books, but one of them is called Quiet by Susan Cain. And Susan Cain, uh, one of the top most viewed TED Talks. And can I also commend to you Zara's brilliant TEDx talk. Absolutely sensational. Look up Zara. Great talk. Very funny, very lovely. And she's out there. But these are great. But Susan's book is called Quiet, Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And she puts forward that 30... In fact, as a touch extroverted, I've bought a half a dozen copies. It should be compulsive reading for extroverts as well. I bought a half a dozen, gifted to people. But... 30 to 50 percent of people around the world are extroverts. Introverts, forgive me. 30 to introverts. In healthcare, it's 70 percent. And I run a workshop I call "How to Work with People You Really Want to Kill." <laughs> <laughs> and the majority of people who work in healthcare actually are what we call, uh, if you use bird analogies, they're owls or doves. Very bright, very knowledgeable, very committed, as opposed to eagles or Peacocks. Now that means the doves and owls, that's the gentle, quieter ones, the more introverts. The eagles and peacocks, as you imagine, will be more extrovert. 70%. Now that kind of means a lot of great things for us. We're good, we stay in the job, we're committed, we're passionate, we deal with safety, we want to st we stay when others would leave. That's what you know, the, the more gentle folk do. The CEOs in the uh, Australian health system, they only, well, they only last an average of 19 months. You know? really high churn and that's not what thank god it's not like this but that's what uh the personality of healthcare is and i think it's not a bad thing i think introversion is really very important <laughs> it's great but you know while everyone just wants to be liked except for tom tom just doesn't <laughs> I'm thinking to myself that Tom's probably a surgeon. I don't know. <laughs> what really, really matters most is how you feel about yourself. That's... <laughs> Do you know, here we are. In our pockets and our handbags, we have a, a device that can open up the whole access to the whole universe. And what do we use it for? Putting pictures of cats on Facebook. <laughs> 
But the thing is, maximise your impact. Don't waste your anything's energy on things you can't control. Put it into the things you can. Take bite-sized chunks. Know what you want to achieve, because the minute you give yourself a target, you dramatically improve your chances of hitting it. But at the same time, don't lose sight of the big picture. It's quite important. <laughs> it's quite important. <laughs> so, paramedic training hasn't been going that well. <laughs> this is what I believe that leadership is. Leadership is the power of influence, not control. And I've been the, an exec director with tens of millions, oh God, bu buckets of money of budgets, hundreds of staff, nice corner office, and do you know what? It's really dull and boring. Actually, it's far more important to be influential, to have heart, than to have power. And when you have great influence, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> There's the finance director. <laughs> But if, remember this, if you, if you show, tell me something, I'm going to forget it. If you show me, I might remember. If you involve me, this is something we do. This is ours. So do whatever it takes to empower, to influence, to inspire and communicate. You can't talk about stuff enough, sharing that passion, communicating that passion, being proactive and being positive. Isn't it much more fun working with Tigger than Eeyore? <laughs> it's a choice. See, jo uh, Irish Nobel laureate, um, you know, uh, said this, I'm trying to think who it was, was it Sam Beckett? Who was it? Oh, no, it, was, um, it doesn't matter. It'll come back to me. But it was 1924. He wrote a book called Back to Methuselah. And he was appropriated by John F. Kennedy because he said this, George Bern Bernard Shaw. Thank you, George. <laughs> you see things that say, why? But I see things that never were and say, why not? Why not be the biggest, greatest organization there can be for primary health care nurses? Why not be the greatest practice nurse there can be where you work? The greatest primary health care provider? Because it's about dreaming big. <laughs> Out loud, at high volume. And, you know, when you start on a journey, truly, it's, it's not a hill, it's a mountain when you start out the climb. And this is the west coast of Ireland, uh, a mountain called Crow Patrick. It's about 35, 40 k's from where I was born and from raised. And this is quite, you see, St. Patrick went up there and he prayed for 40 days and 40 nights for the Irish. We needed all the help we could get. <laughs> he prayed we would never have snakes in Ireland, which is a fantastic miracle until you realize we never had them in the first place. <laughs> but we're not going to quibble, you know. But the other thing is, this is quite a significant photograph. Because the thing is, there are three fantastic days in Ireland. They're called Christmas, St. Patrick's Day, and Summer. <laughs> there they are. And this is another view of Kirkpatrick. And if you look very closely at the top of the dot, you'll see a church where in 1905, men with mules brought the stones up the top of Kirkpatrick to build a church, St. Patrick's Bed. And up to 30, 40,000 people on the last Sunday in July climbed that. Some people wear, you know, in nothing but their feet. Well, actually, no, they wear more than their feet, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but do you remember when we were all studying? How many of you have, have already thought, my gosh, is it halfway through May already? Amazing, isn't it? Do you remember when you look forward and you're doing your papers, you're doing a piece of work, and you look forward, but do you know what it's like when you look back, how quick that went and how... Doug Hammarskjöld, the UN Secretary General, once said, never look at the height of a mountain until you see the top, and then you'll see how low it was. Because think of what you've achieved already. Look at what you've got on your seventh conference already. You have groupies, like <laughs> the fabulous Deb and Sue Cross. You know, the people I want to be when I grow up, amazing. <laughs> but it's also, ultimately, it's about you. It's about you, and it's about a story of a 42-year-old introverted seamstress. On 1st December 1955, got on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, went a few stops along, and was told by the bus driver, James Blake, to move to the back. Why? Because she was black. Anyone know her name? Rosa Parks. And on this day, and James Blake, he had formed, he truly was a racist. On this day, he said, go to the back. And she said, no. And later she said, 
it wasn't that I was tired. I was just tired of giving in. And she got arrested. And she got arrested, and within days, another young, where, you know, where her act of sitting down led people to march. And within days, another young black man was standing by her, protesting against that bus company. They went a year, they went a year without buses. They boycotted that bus at that company for a year. People were walking 15 miles a day because they said it was the right thing to do. And when she sat down, on the 20, she lit the flame of the civil rights movement in America. And where she sat down on the 28th of August, 1963, Martin Luther King marched. Where it started with one, it soon became hundreds, then became a million people. And he talked about his dream. He talked about how the mighty streams of consciousness rolling down the rivers. He talked about the arc of history being long but bending towards justice. He talked about how he looked forward to the day when his young, four black young children could split and play with four young white children and they'd be judged not of the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. He talked about, I may not get there with you. He almost prophesied his own death one early evening in April 1968. What he talked about was his dream. And 40% of the people there, they weren't black. They were white. They were Native Americans. They were from the Indian subcontinent because they were there for them, because he represented something bigger than themselves. What he didn't do is he didn't come and say, I have a 10-point strategy document. Because <laughs> he connected with their hearts. And exactly... 45 years to the day, on the 28th of August 2008, another young black man could accept a democratic ticket. And where Rosa Parks sat down and Martin Luther King marched, Barack Obama could run for the presidency of the United States. And look at all those people, because they were there, because it mattered to them too. So don't let anyone estimate the past to underestimate the power of introverts. But it's also about rethinking our language. Today, one of my best friends is renewing his vows in front of his wife and his three young children. And Mark and I grew up together. And he's dying of cancer. And the question as he goes on this journey, I ask is not what's the matter with you, it's what matters to you. And saying that to our patients is important. And Mary's amazing disposition yesterday is about getting underneath. It's about compassion, that word compassion. To my mind, that's the fusion of two words, compass and passion. It's the lodestar, the guides that takes us to do the things that we love. It's about heart and consciousness, conscience, and hidden in plain sight of these words is art and science. It's about changing our thinking to reconceptualize our understanding of the scope of practice because we get very exercised as nurses about what we can do. And maybe the questions we should be asking is what can our patients do? What can their relatives do? When you think about the incredibly complex things that children, parents of children are doing, because what is the philosophy of a pediatric service? That the children don't come to hospital. So we liberate our patients because they become our allies, our partners. We can't do it all ourselves. We need to find out what their scope of practice should be, and it should be and could be endless. It's also about this. It's not just about being brave to bold. It's also raving till you're old. <laughs> it's about dreaming out loud at high volume to the last day. You've had three people here. They were here for 50 years in our profession. And I will draw, if I may, about four or five more minutes, if I may. I want to talk to you about something. A construct that turned up fully formed in my head one day when I was teaching older people's nurses and doctors, and it was about a thousand days. And we were talking about patient time. 
And if you are a, a white Australian man, you can expect to live to about the age of 78. And if you're a white Australian woman, you can expect to live to the age of about 83. And there's a lot of work to be done in Aboriginal and Torres Islanders, but it's about closing that gap. But right now, we'll focus on a white Australian man of 78, a white Australian woman of 80, and supposing they get to being that 75-year-old man or that 80-year-old woman, what have you got left? What have you got left? Is a thousand days. And I know that once you get past the age of five, you know, life expectancy goes up. The longer you live, the longer you can expect to live. But what is it you see so many of it? Who is it you see so many of it? You see older people. And every day somebody waits longer for an appointment than they must is stealing their time. Every time they wait in a hospital bed because we can't organize our discharges is stealing their time. Because while we're busy and our time is important, our patient's time is sacred. And it's about recognizing this. <laughs> no relatives. <laughs> it's about knowing. My dad, God rest him, he would talk about, and my mother died 27 years ago yesterday. And I was gifted to be allowed to nurse her because I'd only just qualified as a general nurse at Dundas Hike to nurse her to keep her at home. She had a brain tumor, and I was able to keep her at home. Now, my profession gave me the greatest gift, was to be able to give something back to the woman who brought me into this world. How lucky can you be to be what we are, whether we're doctors, whether we're nurses, or allied health professionals. But when I was 18, I remember reading John Steinbeck's book, and it changed the whole course of my thinking about life, because he had this to say, he says, far away in the future, the thousand lives we could have led are waiting for us to turn up. But once we get there, it's only going to be one of them. And please, God, one day we'll be that 80-year-old woman, that 75-year-old man. And we'll be able to look back and say, I didn't get rich. I didn't get famous. But I mattered. I mattered to my community. I mattered to my profession. I mattered to my friends. I mattered to my family and my people. I had a life that matters and what a great gift that is and growing up in the wild west of Ireland two things I knew one Australia was a fierce long way away <laughs> and it was big and even more impressive you had a kangaroo that knew how to talk like Skippy <laughs> that was very impressive when you're a young Irishman truly but I also knew that New Zealand was even further and they had sheep that were even more nervous than ours. <laughs> They're getting worried now because there's, there's, there's a new census. There's only six for every person. <laughs> but they also had the greatest rugby team. We still haven't beaten. They also had the greatest mountaineer of all who climbed the greatest mountain, Edmund Hillary. And he also had this to say, and it's a truth for all of us and all of our lives, because it's not they who stop us from doing anything. Often our greatest person to stop us is we. And it's this. He had this to say. It's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That was amazing, Brian. Thank you, Thank you so much.